Lord, we, uh, we're just so thankful for your presence, and that even though you are perfect in every way, you've chosen to use people like us to accomplish your purposes on the earth, and we're uh, humbled by that, sobered by that, and so we just ask that uh, you would anoint me and anoint all of us to hear and to properly respond to your word and your truth this morning, God, for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, a lot of Sunday mornings, I'm next door. I have the privilege of ministering to our elementary age children. And last Sunday, we dove into Daniel chapter 4, and I introduced them to a concept called a lethal weapon. A lethal weapon is uh, any weapon that a person or uh, an army, uh, a government leader, even the evil one might use to destroy a person, a group of persons, uh, one's enemies. And I, I spoke to them, for some of them they knew this, some not, uh, about Satan. He's revealed, he has many titles, many names, but one that he's given in the book of Revelation is that of destroyer. He lives to destroy human beings, whether in the womb or outside of the womb. He's done that since he was kicked out of heaven with his fellow demons, and um, one of the ways he uh, chooses to destroy or uses to destroy, one of the lethal weapons, maybe the most lethal weapon he has come up with, is that of raising up godless, secular, atheistic leaders of nations, presidents, premiers, kings, queens, whatever they're called, to wreak Mass destruction, uh, sometimes on their own people. Uh, some examples of this. In the last couple of centuries, perhaps the worst one, the premier of China, Mao Zedong, in the years, I wrote this down, 1958 to 61, 1966 to 69, in China, and then... 1949 to 1950 in Tibet, next door to China, it's estimated that he uh, had killed somewhere between 49 and 78 million people. To give you some perspective on how many people that is, because the kids last week definitely didn't get it. I know we struggle to get such numbers. This would be as if all of the 39 million people in California and all the people in Nevada were just gone. If you can imagine that. What about Adolf Hitler in Germany? 1939 to 1945, he was responsible for around 6 million Jews being exterminated. Not only that, he was responsible for around 3 million POWs, Russian POWs, uh, dying. He just left them to die. And then there were people with disabilities, black people, others that in his uh, pursuit to purify the German population, uh, he made sure they were exterminated. We could go on and talk about uh, the six million people killed by Stalin in Russia. We could talk about the millions killed by Pol Pot in Cambodia. What all these leaders had in common was uh, no Judeo-Christian foundation. Uh, they, they didn't fear God. To them, they were God. They were secularists who saw themselves as the ultimate authority. As far as biblical history goes, we could talk about Pharaoh's attempt to uh, kill all the uh, male children. We could talk about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of a, a lot of Jews. I don't know for sure how many when Babylon overtook um, Jerusalem. 
uh, King Herod's destruction of all the male children, baby boys, uh, when he heard about this Messiah, this other king being born. Satan is a vicious, ruthless destroyer. And one of his most lethal weapons is leaders of nations who do not fear God and do not see the inherent value of all humans, whether it's still in the womb or outside the womb. That's why when we citizens of a given nation are oppressed uh, by such leaders, we have to remember what the Apostle Paul stated in Ephesians 6.12, because we lose sight of this all the time. He said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness, where? In the heavenly places. Now, none of this has caught God by surprise, nor is He in any way hindered from accomplishing His purposes by this. So, what are His divine weapons to overcome Satan's lethal weapons? Well, one of them is that of raising up godly men and women who by God's help can win favor with evil pagan rulers and either, and hopefully stop their evil intentions or at least minimize them. Principled men and women who know and walk with God and fear Him far more than any man and who exude, exude, uh, manifest His character in everything they do Some things I write, I can't speak. Um, Men and women who, uh, because of their walk with God and and their character that comes out of their walk with God, uh, can be used by God even amongst evil leaders and their administrations. These are people that Satan greatly fears and God greatly delights in. Queen Esther's favor with King Ahasuerus is a great example where he uh, put a man in office who hated Jews and came up with a plan to exterminate all the Jews in that uh, uh, massive province that Ahasuerus uh, ruled over. And uh, God raised up a woman named Esther Her walk with God in that book is not really spelled out, but had she not feared God, she would have not been able to be. And had she not been willing to be in the place God put her in. Daniel, whom God used to keep all the magicians, sorcerers, conjurers, and Chaldeans from being destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar when they failed uh, being able to Uh, come up with both his dream and interpretation of the dream, God raised up Daniel to uh, preserve them. And of course, that's who we've been learning about the last four or five weeks in our study of Daniel. Daniel's the ultimate model, I think, in Scripture of being used by God to affect people of great influence because he served under four different godless kings in Babylon. Because God does not in any way fear men or women of influence, whether in government, the military, the media, universities, and because God God loves and cares for the people who could be negatively affected by these leaders, um, and because God wants each of His children to become like Him in every way, including this way, he will often raise up and insert his seasoned children or servants in places of great influence. Sometimes no one even really knows they're there. I have a very good friend uh, since college days who because of his skills, uh, his talents, and his uh, seasoned business, and because of his godliness, knows some people in very high places, and I can't be any more specific. But I asked him this morning in a text, 
Uh, he doesn't live near here. Uh, if indeed he knew of an individual or more who know Jesus and walk with Jesus in a certain um, entity that you know of, and he said yes, several. Had lunch with one of them last week, and in that lunch uh, held this person accountable to steward well the influence this person has. A lot more of this is happening on the planet than any of us know. Sometimes it's good we don't know because we'd probably mouth off on it and put them in danger. Satan, of course, hates such men and women. Always has. He's aware of them. And thus he tries his best to destroy them or at least have them jailed or, or shut up in some way or another. And that's what we see, isn't it, in Daniel chapter 6. If you haven't turned there in your Bibles or on your phones, turn to Daniel chapter 6, and it starts off with these words, It seemed good to Darius. Well, who's this Darius? Well, we learned last week when Josh was preaching at the end of chapter 5 um, that Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain or assassinated. And it says, So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62, chapter 5, verse 31. But how did he receive it? By conquering it? Well, we don't think so. It appears that uh, he was given an assignment to rule over Babylon, which was a comparatively small portion of this vast Medo-Persian empire. And this assignment was given to him by Cyrus. We've, one of the reasons we think that is chapter 9, verse 1 says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was, made, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans. Well, as Darius began to get a feel for what this assignment was going to entail, verse 1 of chapter 6 tells us that he chose to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom. A satrap is basically a a governor or a mayor uh, over a a province. Their responsibility, it goes on to say in verse 1, to be in charge of the whole kingdom. But who was going to keep them on task? Who was going to help them accomplish their responsibilities? Verse 2 answers that question. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Inefficiency and dysfunction in government is not merely a modern thing. Government workers that are hired and not called have always been a major cog in the wheels of government. And thus, they need constant and effective supervision. Well, that's the opening context of Daniel chapter 6. So, (coughs) if one of Satan's primary lethal weapons is to destroy as many humans as he can by raising up godless and ruthless kings and queens and presidents of nations and giving them a hatred or disgust of certain sectors of their population, not to mention a desire to destroy their enemies in other nations. And if one of God's primary weapons is to raise up modern-day Esthers and Daniels to serve under those administrations and help them think twice about their evil intentions and the consequences of those intentions, then how can we be the kind of people that God might use to help these leaders of whatever nation we live in seek a better way, or see a better way. Another question we ought to be asking as we go through this series, especially the first six chapters, is how can we in the church develop the kind of church culture in our particular congregation that produces men and women, think next door, 30 children, Uh, could be 30 children if they all show up. How can we be the kind of church culture that 
raises up men and women that God can set His hand on and positively use to change the thinking of influential leaders. Now the reality is most of us in this room are probably not going to end up serving alongside uh, or in the administration or cabinet of some of these kinds of leaders. But all of us, by the Spirit of God, can do more than we think to help the church, and especially these young ones like J.D. back there, uh, develop the kind of walk with God and the kind of skills and the kind of mindset where God could put them in a place that no one, not even them, would ever imagine. Daniel's and Esther's and Joseph's and Nehemiah's, uh, not to mention prophets and prophetesses, these people throughout uh, human history have been raised up and used by God to avert all kinds of evil. We're aware of all the evil that, that leaders have done, but we're not aware often of all the evil they might have done. Another reality is, the people we vote for may not be elected, especially for disciples of Jesus Christ who vote, for, uh, vote according to biblical principles and, and truth in states like California. But as disappointing as that might be, God's hands aren't tied by ungodly people being uh, voted into office. He has many other weapons and strategies that we ought to be on top of. Always reminding ourselves, well, yeah, oh, darn it, look at that. Oh, well, not the person I voted for didn't get elected, but God's hands aren't in any way tied by that. Especially as the church learns to pray aright. So I want to suggest a few things from this chapter that can especially guide our intercession as we are to be a people of prayer. First, we must, by the Spirit of God, learn to cultivate in our hidden life what Daniel 5.12 and Daniel 6.3 call an extraordinary spirit. Let's read verse 3. Then this Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Remember chapter 5 last week? Uh, Belshazzar is boastfully uh, having a party, showing off some things. This hand appears, writes some things on the wall. His knees start shaking. And his wife reminds him, there is a man uh, that you're father knew and, and knew to use him and, um, and to, you know, to use his skills and, and so forth. And um, she called him, as she was describing this guy to her husband, she says, he had an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretations of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems. Chapter 5, verse 12. So, what can we make of this extraordinary spirit that's mentioned both in chapter 5 and chapter 6, uh, speaking of Daniel? Well, first of all, I would say it is a human spirit that is very sensitive to God's spirit. You see, Daniel knew his flesh or his human nature was never going to be sufficient for the mission God had called him to accomplish no matter how hard he worked or how hard he tried. He knew that ultimately the problems of nations are supernatural problems that require supernatural solutions. Most of his contemporaries had not learned that important reality. The second thing I would say about this extraordinary spirit of Daniel's is he very early in life learned what the Apostle Paul would later pen in his first letter to the church in Corinth. Uh, you find this in 1 Corinthians 6.12, and it reads like this. All things are lawful for me, 
but not all things are profitable. Remember that verse? All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. So, when Daniel was first brought into the service of King Neb, uh, as described in Daniel chapter 1, we find that he and these other young men being groomed for the service of the king were basically invited to cruise ship eating and drinking every day of their service. Daniel had every legal right and even expectation to imbibe along with the others, but surprisingly, he refused. Because Daniel, I think, had already learned in his Jewish upbringing, very likely under godly parents, that intimacy and favor with God is significantly affected or impacted by uh, our inner life and our character. Very possibly he learned that from the psalmist. Maybe from one of... I mean, there's a number of psalms, but Psalm 24 is the one that came to my mind where he says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in His holy place? In other words, who could possibly walk with and be and experience intimacy with the living God of the universe? He goes on, He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Verse 8 of chapter 1 tells us that Daniel made up his mind. Or better, literally, it should read, Daniel set upon his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. Actually, the word defile comes up twice in that verse. Daniel was very, very attuned to anything that might defile him and harm his intimacy with God. He knew that intimacy with and usefulness to His holy God of Israel depended at least in part on His refusal to have anything to do with the things everyone else around Him didn't think twice about enjoying. Of course, I think He knew these foods and wines were dedicated to idols. Uh, It doesn't mean that these foods and wines in and of themselves were necessarily wrong. But there was, there's a process of how these things are served, and often it was intertwined with idol worship. The third thing I would say about this extraordinary spirit of Daniel's is he somehow had come to the point in his life where money and things no longer, if they ever, had a hold on him. When King Belshazzar is recounted in chapter 5, offered riches and honor and all kinds of rewards to Daniel if he could interpret the handwriting on the wall, Daniel shockingly replied, keep your gifts for yourself. And I don't think he said that uh, sarcastically. I think he just didn't want to. Keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. Now, if the king had offered any of these things to Daniel's contemporaries, ah, they would have been salivating like crazy. But Daniel just knew better. They, they did, bling meant nothing to him. Things meant nothing to him. I think the satisfaction and fulfillment he got from walking with God and pleasing Him far outweighed any pleasure or perks that the world might give him. Another thing I would say about this extraordinary spirit of Daniel's is he had somehow cultivated early in his life and never departed from the truth and reality that intimacy and influence with God depended to some degree upon his refusal to engage in the uh, rampant corruption and lying and falsehood that most of his contemporaries walked in probably unconsciously. It was such such a part of the culture there. And I think, again, I wonder if Daniel was thinking of Psalm 24 when he was tempted with these, these things day by day, where David again wrote, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord and who may stand in His holy place? 
he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. You see, the more Daniel walked with God, the more he knew God was true through and through. And that God greatly valued truth and hated falsehood. And thus Daniel, through his communion with God and his reliance upon God, learned to do the same. I don't know what demons were assigned to bring about destruction in Babylon at that time in history. But I can promise you Daniel was a major headache to these demons. For just as God routinely and strategically seeks to raise up and establish Daniel and Esther, Joseph uh, types among every nation and people, the enemy seeks to get rid of them. And one of the ways the enemy seeks to do that is by causing the contemporaries of God's servants to rise up in jealousy, envy, and resentment. And that's what we see in, as we read on in Daniel chapter 6. Let's look at verses 4 and 5. Then the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful. And no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, We'll not found, find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Why, pray tell, would all of these government workers want to get rid of someone who never cheated, never came in late, never left early, didn't take long breaks, did everything he was supposed to do, and probably solved problems in the workplace that affected all of them. He probably prayed for their personal crises when they ran into each other at the water fountain or whatever they had back then. Um, well, ultimately, it's a spiritual war. That's, the, that's really the only way you can understand this. You know, these people probably did come to work late, probably did leave early, probably did take long breaks, probably did cut corners. And the devil just knows, he, just, he uses people in the light to make people in the darkness very, very uncomfortable. So how do you get rid of such a faithful, helpful guy uh, who's also one of Darius's three commissioners. Well, let's read on in verses 6 to 9. Then these commissioners and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for thirty days shall be cast into the lion's den. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, that is, the injunction. Sadly, often, leaders of governments and nations have so many responsibilities and commitments that they neglect their inner life. They ignore the God who made them and placed them in office and thus have minimal discernment uh, into the possible motives of those around them that appear to be trying to help them, but in fact have other things in mind. And such was the case with Darius at this point. <coughs> Daniel, being one of the three commissioners, was not unaware of this wicked scheme of his envious colleagues. But what's fascinating is how that awareness affected him, or actually didn't affect him. For you see, Daniel was a 
principled man. That is, he operated according to core convictions, not current pressing circumstances and pressures. This is another secret for, I, for how he was able to walk in that extraordinary spirit, and we see it in verse 10 especially. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he knew they were going to try to get it signed, he knew when Darius signed it, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. This was his probably, uh, maybe lifelong habit, at, at least a habit for many years. And not only had Daniel cultivated this practice of daily prayer and three times a day prayer, he also didn't try to hide it. Now, I don't think he was flouting it. Uh, his windows weren't open to show people how religious he was. Rather, they appear to be open because of his passion for God's glory and God's highest purposes for Israel and its worship center, Jerusalem, to be accomplished. Daniel knew how God felt about his people, Israel, and about Jerusalem, and thus he felt it important when praying to not lose sight of that. And the open windows towards Jerusalem were kind of a prop to help him keep this in focus when he prayed. How did Daniel cultivate this extraordinary spirit? Well, one way for sure was he set his heart to make prayer and communion with God a high priority. And nothing, not busyness, not pressing responsibilities, or even the threat of a horrible death in a lion's den could keep him from it. S.D. Gordon was greatly used of God in our nation in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He was a praying man. And he wrote these words about the spiritual discipline of prayer. The greatest thing anyone can do for God and man is pray. It's not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer, but I mean those people who take time. To pray. Daniel took the time to pray. Every day of his adult life at least. Small wonder that his contemporaries and colleagues, most of whom were pawns of the evil one, tried to get rid of him. All of you who have read the rest of the story or have heard about the rest of the story know that God, who was so pleased with his servant Daniel, told every one of those hungry, man-eating lions to shut their mouths while he was with them. He might have given them a hint that a, a, a great feast was coming soon after. Because the story is that Darius, King Darius, who couldn't sleep all night, fasted, didn't, doesn't say he prayed, but my guess is he probably did, uh, ran to the lion's den the next morning, called out to Daniel. Daniel, uh, and uh, you know, another thing that I don't have time to go in on, uh, noting my time here. Um, but another thing about this extraordinary spirit is uh, the way Daniel responded, because Darius runs to the den and he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to destroy you from the lions? And Daniel could have said, well, not thanks to you, Darius. But listen how he responds. O oh, king, live forever. Another ingredient of this extraordinary spirit is the ability, and it's supernatural, to honor evil people that God has chosen you to serve. 
some of you might be getting a little uncomfortable with me using the word evil and wicked so much, but if you're not righteous, there's two kingdoms, okay, on planet earth. Only two. One is the kingdom of God, which you have to be born again by the Spirit of God to be a part of, and one is the kingdom of Satan, the, the domain of darkness. The, every person in that kingdom, he is their father, not he, Satan is their father. So, I'm sorry, but they walk in evil and wickedness. They know nothing else. So, I don't say that mean. It's just biblical. It's truth. It's reality. But the amazing thing about Daniel is, and is what's so extraordinary about his spirit, is he saw the evil and wickedness and hard-heartedness in their lives and practice every day, but he honored not just Darius, because Darius was the one most God-fearing, it appears, most affected by Daniel, I think, though Neb was also as well. But Daniel, from his heart, honored these people. He knew they were people God created in His image and wanted them to repent and know Him. So I want us to spend a little bit of time praying. I, I know our attention is so focused on this election and the need to get out and vote. I trust all of you have done that or will soon. Ann and I uh, took our ballots to the post office on Thursday, I think. Um, that is important. But, gosh, we've got to look beyond that. We've got to look beyond the results of that, especially in our state, and know that God is working. And He'll work more. Somehow, He will work more if we pray for these kind of things. So I want us to pray some for God to raise up modern day Daniels and Josephs and Nehemiahs and Esthers, especially in our state, because we're to some degree responsible for what happens in this state. But I also want to say before we pray, I mentioned earlier, there's only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness that Satan rules, there's the kingdom of God that Jesus rules. You're in one or the other. And you know, God chose to shut the mouths of the lions when Daniel was thrown in the lion den. But when Jesus was unjustly arrested by evil men, a mob, the mob mentality seen at its worst, and then accused falsely, and then beaten unjustly and mercilessly, God didn't intervene. Not once. God let everything these evil men chose to do to His Son happen because we needed a Savior. We needed a Lamb, a sacrificial Lamb who is both God and man and who could die in our place to bring us to God, 1 Peter 3 says. So if you've never responded to that amazing truth and reality that God so loves you that He let His Son be beaten to smithereens so that you wouldn't have to face divine wrath and divine justice, then why in the world would you go any longer from entering His kingdom and getting out of this kingdom of darkness? You can do it with a prayer. The Bible says whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It can happen in an instant. Okay. Let's pray just a little bit and then we need to be done here. Let's pray for this strategy of God, this way of God, to be greatly expanded in our nation, in our state, even among the nations of the earth. And that the body of Christ would just be constantly producing such people. Lord, we pray every one of those children over there would become so godly and so talented and so skilled that, and, and learn to honor all authority, that you could put them in places of great influence for your glory.